Good morning, Hollywood Christian School. How are we doing this morning? Good, fantastic. All right, I, I do pray that each of you enjoyed your break and, and got some uh, much needed rest and are prepared to, to go into the rest of this school year. Um, I, I, I do want to share with you, I know that around this time of the year, things kind of, we kind of get a little bit tired and, and start trying to slack off a little bit, but really this is the time of the year where you really have to punch it hard. Uh, in a couple of weeks, you all will be taking your SAT-10 test, uh, which are, are very important for us as a school. And I wish I had the graphics to put up and show you, uh, but I, I do want you to know that I, I, have, I was very pleased with the performance that, that you all as, a, as our secondary department demonstrated in our last exams that we took. Um, one of the things that we measure uh, from year to year is two things. One of them, we measure growth, which, gives, which tells us how much you grow from one year to the next. Uh, which is basically a percentage. So it's a percentage of how much you grew over the course of a year. The other thing we measure is proficiency, which is how much you actually learn in terms of that current grade learning objective. When you get at the high school level, growth tends to decrease just a little bit because you're becoming more and more of an independent student and the work is just really starting to hit a ceiling in terms of the amount of rigor. In other words, you're taking some very hard classes at the high school level. But what your last test results show was that you all are performing at very high levels on average in comparison to other kids in this country. Uh, so the hard work that your teachers are putting in, the work that you're putting in, it's, it's starting to pay off. Now, I know that you may sit back and say, man, I'm having a hard time in math this year. Man, I'm having a hard time in, in history or language arts. That, that's because you're struggling with right now. We're looking at how much you grow and how much proficiency you demonstrate from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So if you're still, if you're still challenged with this year's curriculum, uh, that's expected because you're still learning, you're still trying to master everything. Uh, but I do want you to know that I have gone and looked at those scores uh, and, and on average, uh, not for everybody, but on average, you all are performing very well when it comes to those, those assessments. So that's kudos to you, that's kudos to your teachers and your parents for the hard work that's being put in. So when we get ready to take these tests again in another couple of weeks, I am looking forward uh, to the performance that you all will demonstrate on those. So good job to you all. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to move into today's message. Father, we thank you so much just for you being you. Uh, Father, we stop and we pause in this moment. Just pray that your presence will be upon us. Pray that your spirit will be in this room, that you're working our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and to prepare us to hear from you. Father, this day we just pray that you would just educate us concerning your wisdom, concerning your knowledge and understanding. Pray that you would govern us, that you would keep us so that we can do your will your way. Father, may your name and your kingdom be glorified in this place this morning, we pray, and it's in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, we have been traveling um, through the book of Matthew and have been picking up kingdom principles as we go throughout. We've been dealing with understanding the kingdom. Uh, our vision here at Hollywood Christian School is that we become a catalyst for world-class kingdom-centered education. And that's why you hear this theme of the kingdom uh, in everything that we do. Because before anything else, we want to make sure that you know who you are in the kingdom of God and that you understand your place in it. So that's why we have so much emphasis on the kingdom of God. And we've been dealing with that this whole entire year. And no matter how many years we teach this message, you can never teach it all. Uh, today, I want to kind of fall back a little bit and have some balance. Because I, most of the time when we do these messages, I'm primarily speaking. Uh, but today I want you to prepare yourself to actually engage with the message as well because I want to hear some things from you and I want to actually ask you all some questions this morning uh, related to what we're going over in the scriptures. So we're going to look at Matthew uh, chapter 15, which is where we picked off at last, picked up, uh, left off last time. Matthew chapter 15 uh, verse 1 begins saying this, Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. So just pause for a moment there. So the Pharisees and the scribes were trying to find a way to corner Jesus. They were trying to catch him in his words, and they were trying to make him look bad in front of the crowd. 
So they, they came up to him and they wanted to know why is it that, that you all are not following or your disciples don't follow these rules that all the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and everybody else follow. We, we, we say that this is extremely important, but your disciples don't follow this rule. And, and Jesus turned around and asked them, you're asking me, why don't my disciples follow your rules? Why don't you follow God's rules? So they tried to corner him, but he ended up cornering them. Let's read the rest of it. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. In other words, they were trying to use God as a cover. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandment is me. And those are probably the most important verses I want to make sure that we get in this morning. So I'm going to read those again. He said, you hypocrites, where did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me? Because that indicates that it's possible to praise God with our mouth and not be honoring him in our hearts. And that's important when we consider the landscape of the world in which we live right now, where, where that's very common for somebody to say, I love Christ, I follow Jesus, and not necessarily live that way. It's, it's okay to take the things of God and mix them in with the things of the world and say that it's all right because it makes me feel good or I agree with it or it's popular. So sometimes the thing that people say are good and that people say are right don't necessarily line up with God because it's the same the thing about God the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forevermore his truth does not change his truth is not relative his truth is not being based on popular opinion so if we're going to live with a kingdom mentality then we have to have the mindset that God is right today God was right yesterday and God is right forevermore. And, and that's the mindset that we have to operate from, that God doesn't change his truth based on what people say. Then the scripture says this, and he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. See, they were trying to say that because you were eating with unwashed hands, that that made you a bad person. But, but Jesus was saying, there's nothing you can put in your mouth that's going to defile you as a person. He said, it's the things that come up out of your mouth that defile you. And here's why he said that. He said, then the disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my father has not planted will be rooted. Let them alone. There are blind guys, and if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see? Here it is. That whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled. But what goes out of the mouth proceeds from the what? From the heart. So, so Jesus was saying that it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you or make you bad or make you wrong. He said, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you because what comes out of your mouth is rooted in your heart. What comes out of your mouth is rooted in the issues of your heart. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Uh, the reason why this issue is, is so important is because th there's a difference between operating from your gifts that you have, because all of us have gifts, and operating from the Spirit of God. Because you can, be very, you can become very popular with your gifts. You can become very famous with your talents. You become well known for the things that you're able to do, the skills that you have. They can make you popular, they can earn you a lot of money. There's a difference though between carrying out your gifts and being effective. Because just because you are doing something doesn't make you, doesn't make you effective in doing it. 
And, and we have to learn how to live life where we're operating from the authority of God and His Spirit so that we are effective in what we're doing. And, and so we have to deal with these issues of the heart. When you have anger issues, when you have problems, when you have uh, hatred for other people, those are not always issues with other folks. Sometimes there are issues in our heart that we have not dealt with yet. So if we're going to live from a kingdom mentality, we've got to turn and address the issues of the heart. And let me tell you something, that's not always pretty to do. That's not always fun to do. That self-examination, though, is extremely necessary because there are things inside of all of us that Jesus said bring forth evil thoughts that make us uh, commit sexual immorality, that get us tied up in things that we should not be tied up in. He said it's from the heart that we have all of these issues. So you know people around you that might say bad stuff, that might do bad stuff. It's not so much that person, but it's the heart that is in that person. But let's define this thing heart for just a minute. Because when we talk about heart, we're not talking about your physical heart. We're not talking about your physical heart. And sometimes the words can be used interchangeably, but we're not even talking about your mind, what you think, your will, your emotions. But when we refer to the heart, the heart, while used interchangeably with the mind, actually refers to your subconscious. You'll see the word heart being used different ways, and that's nothing wrong with that. But when we really truly talk about your heart, where the issues of life flow from, your heart is really your subconscious mind. It's, it's not even where you think your thoughts. So when you think before you do something, you're not acting from your heart, really. Your heart is mostly the stuff that you do automatically, even without thinking, because it's rooted in your subconscious. You don't think in your subconscious. You're not conscious there. But there are things that feed your subconscious. There are things that inform your subconscious. So here's what I mean by that. Your subconscious is basically the sum total of your thoughts, your words, your actions, and environment. When you use your smartphone, you may touch buttons, you may flip the screen, you may do all those different kinds of things. But, but that's not really and truly where the phone is at. Even if you take your phone apart, you won't really see the actual phone. That, that phone and the things that you do on that phone or on that laptop are actually written in coding. It's written digitally. You don't really see it, but it's there, and that's what it's operating from. It's operating from things that you cannot see. So no matter how many times you take it apart, you're not going to see that actual phone, or you're not going to see that actual laptop, because the stuff that's causing it to operate and that's causing it to run are not things that you see with your eyes. But it's working, and it's responding based on the input that you give into it. So you do one thing, and it responds accordingly. Your heart, it's like the computer programming of your mind. It's the operating system of your mind. You get input and you respond based on your subconscious. You respond based on the programming that's in you. And, and all of those things that are in your subconscious come from a lot of different stuff. Your subconscious is being informed right now as we speak. Even if you're not paying attention, your subconscious is still being informed because it's based on your thoughts, things that you think about, that you don't necessarily want to record in your mind. How many of y'all dream dreams at night? Most of you, some of you may not be able to remember all of them, but most of you dream dreams at night. A lot of your dreams come from thoughts that you've had during the day. You just don't recognize it because your subconscious puts it a different way when it represents it to you. You have your whole entire environment, the things around you that inform your subconscious. That's why you have to be careful who you hang around. That's why you've got to be careful uh, where you go and what you do and who you're doing it with. You have to be extremely careful because even if you think you're that strong to resist it all, it's still informing your subconscious in some way or another. You stay there long enough, you'll begin to act just like the people that you're hanging around. So your subconscious is the sum total of your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Let me show you something. I, I've been, I, I don't worry myself about being cool anymore. I think I just got too old for that stuff. And I, and I know you have some pastors and, and, and principals like that who listen to a lot of rap, a lot of hip-hop. I'm I just going to be straight with you. That ain't me. It used to be. I used to listen to a lot of worldly music back when I was first growing up. But I'm, I'm done with that now. But, but every now and then, when stuff starts getting popular, because I lead young people, I have to know what's going on. 
But, but here's what I, I want to challenge you on. Think about some of the music you listen to. That it may sound good to you. It might make you dance. It might make you jump. It might make you do all kind of stuff. There's a message behind the music. And sometimes we get so caught up in the beat that we're not paying attention to the actual message anymore. But that message is still getting in your mind whether you accept it or not. Now, what I do from time to time is I go to the billboard where you see all the, the songs that are, uh, are popular right now. They got all different kinds out there. And, and I look at some of the songs that, that are, are popular. I'm not saying that you listen to them. Most of y'all probably don't. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I went down that list and that, that was probably two people that I recognized. And I, I realized, man, I am seriously out of touch with the world. I don't even recognize most of the people on the, on the top 100 billboard anymore. But there is a song, it's called Heaven by Kane Brown. Y'all heard of that? No? Or you just don't want to admit it? But there's this song called Heaven by Kane Brown, and I think it's, it's number three on the top 100 uh, billboard right now. I want to show you the lyrics from this song for just a minute. And you probably won't be able to see it up there, but just, just bear with me. This is why it's, when, when you're going to listen to music, it's always good to read the lyrics, not just sing the song. Because there are some things that you don't realize that you're saying to yourself. And, and, and let's be honest, when you have your favorite song, do you just listen to it one time? No, you, you put that thing on repeat, and you listen to it over and over and over and over and over again, am I right? So really, this stuff has been written so many times that it's really just getting into your subconscious mind. Here's what it says. He says in this song, he says, this is perfect. Come kiss me one more time. Now, I'm talking about you sitting up and listening to this song, a, a single unmarried person. You listen to this song. Come kiss me one more time. I couldn't dream this up, even if I tried. You and me in this moment feels like magic only. I'm right where I want to be. Everybody's talking about, watch this, everybody's talking about heaven like they just can't wait to go. Saying, how's it going to be so good, so beautiful? Lying next to you in this bed with you, I ain't convinced. Because I don't know how, I don't know how heaven, heaven could be better than this. Now, you talk to me for a minute. And if you would, keep those lyrics up there for me, please. I want you to look at this. I want you to break it apart. Maybe you like the song, maybe you don't like the song. All, all I'm saying is that I want you to take a look at this from a biblical perspective. You hear the song and you can hear the music, but what is the message? So let's take the first, few, the first line. He says, this is perfect. Now, just that word alone, perfect means that you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. That's, it's, it's absolutely perfect. There's nothing else you can do to this thing. So he's defining for you what life is supposed to be, what makes life perfect. Y'all follow me so far? Do we agree? So from the very beginning of the song, he's telling you this is life. This is life. Now, the Bible defines life differently, doesn't it? It said, Jesus came that they may have life, and they may have life what? More abundantly. And, and the life that he gives to us is not the life that the world gives to us. This is the life that the world gives to you. He, he said, this is perfection. This is life. This is what you live and you die by. So he defines that for you. Now, when you first read that, did you think about it that way? Did you really think that he was defining life for you? Yes, no, maybe, sort of. But you, you don't catch this. But it does get rooted in your subconscious mind because here's what happens next. Here's what happens next. Let's say you are a girl and you're listening to this song. And it's a good song. It's very popular. I mean, it's in the top three songs on the billboard right now. You're listening to the song as a female. And you don't just listen to it once. You listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over again. After a while, you're going to begin to look at your life and say, you know what? I don't have this. So y'all talk to me. 
So what happens next with this young lady who has listened to this song? What's the next thing she starts to desire? We could say sex, that's fair. But she, <laughs> she gotta have a boy to do that with, right? <laughs> it's, this is real talk. So now, as a female, you've gotta fix this problem. That, that's something wrong with you because you don't have what the world has told you is perfect. You don't have it. So now you gotta get it. And, and, and not only that, here's what's gonna happen. When you, when you get the first young man, he's still not gonna fit that. Cause he don't, he's not gonna talk to you like that. He's not gonna sing to you like that. He's not gonna quite make you fit that way. And, and it's not gonna be enough. So you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna go find another one. And you're gonna keep going through all of these men trying to find perfection, and guess what? You'll never find it. But by, you get, by the time you get to this point, it's almost too late. It's written in your subconscious mind that you are imperfect, that you are less than somebody else because you don't have a perfect relationship. Now you feel low, you have little self-esteem, and the real man who could probably give you a piece of that heaven don't even want you anymore because you didn't have too many by now. Uh, and that's just the first line of the song. Now we can go through the rest of that and, and it's obvious that he's doing some inappropriate stuff with this. And y'all can take that off now. It's obvious that he's doing some inappropriate stuff with this young lady, right? Very obvious. So the, the message behind this song, even though the beat may sound good, even though it may help you go to bed at night, I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, I never heard the song. I just read the lyrics. It, it may do all of that, but you're getting the wrong message in your heart. And here's what Jesus says is gonna happen. After a while, those things that are in your heart will begin to come out they'll begin to show up, they'll begin to manifest themselves. Watch, watch this video for me real quick, then we'll come back and talk about it. Check this out.
All right. So basically, you get the metaphor of this, right? That you have this, this young lady who allows different men to come along, and they all take a piece of her heart. Now, now this, is, this is gold for males as well as females. It's not just a female thing. But I do have to be real with you. Everybody that you relate to affects you in some way, one or another. They always affect you. And so we want to be careful with who we allow in that place of, in our hearts and within ourselves because they're either going to build you or they're going to tear you down. There are two types of people in life. There are balcony people and there are basement people. Balcony people pull you up. They encourage you. They strengthen you. They make you better. They make you more vigilant. They add to your life. They don't just take away from your life. Basement people, they pull you down. They want you to be down there in that deep, dark basement along with them. They want you to sit in the muddy waters just along with them. They don't care nothing about your success. They don't care nothing about your life. You have to be careful. And I encourage each of you, whether you're male or female in this room, to really be careful and guard your heart. Because if, if you can, and I, I talk to females and males, if, if you can, wait to date. If, if you can't, at least make sure it's a good person. At least make sure it's somebody who is stable. At least make sure it's somebody who is connected with God and not just in words, but in their heart because out of the heart flow the issues of life. So if, if they say that they live for God, they say that they love God, but you don't see the fruit of the spirit in their life, then it ain't God. If you can put it off, put it off. You, you have time for that. And, and I'm talking to you from the other side of having made a lot of mistakes in my life. And most of my mistakes I've made in my life, I can trace back to the relationships that I've had. So I'm, I'm encouraging you, if you can wait, wait to date. But if you can't, at least make sure that the person lines up with the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. The Bible says that to keep your heart with all vigilance, because out of it flow the issues of life. John chapter 12, verse 24 said this, and I'm, I'm tying this up, and I'm going to give you my last point and let you go. The Bible says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And that's interesting. In order for the seed to bear fruit in the ground, it first has to die. Here's, here's a few points I want you to walk away here with. The first one is this. When you believe in Christ, your sinful nature dies. So you, you've been born again. You've accepted Christ into your life. That sinful nature in you dies. But there are matters of your heart and character that still must be put to death. In other words, your sin nature died when you accepted Christ. Your sin nature died when you accepted Christ. But there are still things in your character and there are still things in your heart that have to be put to death. So whenever there are parts of your character that you know don't align with the word of God, don't excuse it away. Which brings me to my next point. A bad attitude, a smart mouth, a short temper, whatever your situation is, whatever you're dealing with, lust, whatever it is, do not define who you are. So stop saying this is just who I am. I just have a quick temper. I just have a bad attitude. I just have issues with girls. Don't stop defining as who you are. That's not who you are. That's who you were. You got to stop excusing that stuff away and start recognizing it as an issue of the heart that I've got to deal with. Those things define who you were before you met Christ, not who you are right now. But there are still some things in you that have to be put to death. Here's my last one. We call this process sanctification. The process of sanctification is just simply allowing God to complete the work he has already begun in you. You all are babies in Christ. You're babies in Jesus. You're still growing. You're still developing. You're still getting there. You're still trying to figure a lot of things out. Let me encourage you. Don't excuse away the things in your life and in your heart that you know are not right. That's not who you are. That's who you used to be before you met Christ. You just haven't dealt with these things in your heart yet. So examine your heart. Examine your life. 
Prepare yourself to live for his kingdom and for his glory. To keep your heart pure, to be diligent, watch your thoughts. The Bible says bring every thought to the, captive to the obedience of Christ. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Watch your environment. Because all those things will one day be written in your heart. And Jesus has said it. If it's in your heart, it's going to come out of you. So even though my sin nature has died, there's still some things in my heart that I still have to bring to Christ and have it die with that part of me. That makes sense? Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bow our hearts to you. You know what's in us. You know what's in our lives. You know what's going on. You know what we're dealing with. Father, we love you and we care for you and we humbly submit ourselves to you. Will you, Father, be patient with us, be gracious towards us, and let your mercy be new every day. Give us the freedom, Father, to be able to deal with these issues as we lay them at your feet. Whatever they are, whatever we're dealing with, let us be all in for you and let our lives truly glorify you. We thank you this morning. We give you praise. Our heart is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.